Okay, fantastic. So we'll get started. We will start with Georgia Greeley. Georgia Greeley, can you share a little bit more about your work and how your work coincides with uh, text and textiles? Thank you so much. I would love to. Thank you all for coming. This is a delight. I have a book called RBG Alphabet Book. And this came about because there was a, a call from the Cadets Gallery in Fergus Falls for an exhibit called RBG Collars. It's all mm -hmm. about her collars and what they are metaphorically and what they meant in her life. And um, this theme pulled at me and I thought about it. it we had quite a, a bit of time beforehand to think about it. And I decided I wanted to do a book. And I immediately wondered how to encapsulate, encapsulate this woman's broad, long life in a little handmade book. Um, and it, I don't, I think from my dream time, I came up the, with the idea of an alphabet book. So I researched her life. And as I did that, um, I took notes, copious notes, and I started underlining specific words and specific phrases. And that's how I came up with the text portion of the book. Um, and the words and phrases for me represented um, prompts into her life or metaphors for her life or an inkling of a larger picture of her life. And that's, I wanted that um, to blend with the format and function of the book itself. The color scheme was easy, black and white on a reflection of her judicial robes. Um, and then of course I immediately thought, now how do I make a black and white book fun and interesting visually? And I chose for the book format an accordion book with pop-up collars because that was the theme of the show, RBG's Collars. And, um, and the accordion book can stretch out. Like if, if you put this book out vertically, it's like six feet long. Mm -hmm. So um, that is kind of a metaphor for her long life. Mm -hmm. The paper I chose is 100% cotton watercolor paper for the pages and also for the text. Um, and that's where the fiber part comes into. I used fiber board, I used fiber paper. Um, I used um, linen thread, waxed linen thread. And this is all part of the book. And then I chose, because it seemed like a very special book to me, I chose to house the book in an all black handmade box covered in Lama Lee Asian paper, which is made from usually the, the fiber of a mulberry tree. Mm -hmm. And I used a black ribbon lift to take the book in and out of the box. So the page design came about because still I'm working with the black and white. So I used sumi ink splotches as a background texture. And I chose that because of her work, because of the murk and mess of life that she had to pull out her judicial decisions from. Um, life is messy. And, and she did such a wonderful job of clearing it up in so many ways. Um, I chose a typewriter font, which I've never worked before for the text because that when she started studying law, that's all she had to work on was a typewriter. And that seemed appropriate. And then I had the collaged words um, also printed on the watercolor paper, but they're printed on white paper. So they kind of emerge visually from the mur murky background. So that's basically the design and how it relates to, I used papers that felt like fiber and um, I did calligraphy for the title, but the way I feel about it is the design and work and thought behind the creation of any book is what makes it authentic, authentic, cohesive, and whole. But the viewer does not have to know any of this 
to come up. Every viewer brings up parts of their own life and they don't need to know my details to come and view a piece of my work and find whatever they find in a book. So this, kind, this book is actually a unique book. There's only one of them, but there is an artist, mm -hmm. artist proof that I made to um, solve all the <laughs> construction problems. Mm -hmm. So there's like a really half-assed book and then there's this book. <laughs> oh, and that's it. Amazing, thank you so much, Georgia. We will go to Trina. Hi. Um, thank you for that information, Georgia. I love hearing about uh, artist process because it's it is like you said when you come to a work, you know I bring what I see and what I feel when I ex experience it. So it's really interesting to hear your, you know, everything that went into it. Um, I I use words in my artwork. Um, because it imagery is open, it is open to so many individual interpretations. And uh, I feel compelled to include the specific information that words provide. And I'm looking down a lot because I, I write out what I want to say um, because it helps me remember what I want to say. Um, because violence against women is something that is very few people are willing to face, even though it's an everyday occurrence. Um, these specific stories, I feel like they need to be put in front of as many people as possible. Um, and that's, uh, anyway, I, I wrote some stuff about the subject matter, uh, about the piece. Um, I'll talk about that first. It started with uh, the poem about rape, which unfortunately is not visible in this uh, one photo. Um, the umbrella in the textile center is hanging from the ceiling above a pedestal that has a pair of rain boots on it. And uh, on the rain boots is a poem uh, called Millions uh, about surviving rape or not surviving rape. Um, and uh, if you want to see the text of that and an image, you can go to minnesotajewishartists.org. Uh, and search my name, Trina Porty, and there's an image of it there. Um, and so that was the beginning was I wanted to do something about walking the walk um, and how to, what does that look like when we're dealing with violence against women? Because most of it takes place uh, in private between the perpetrator and the survivor uh, or the not survivor. And so uh, I also had an old umbrella um, and so it started to come together. And then the raindrops are, each one is a different story of something that has happened. Um, and the underside of the umbrella is an amazing uh, poster that a young woman I saw when I was leaving the first Minnesota Women's March uh, in 2017, which was I think the largest march in Minnesota's history. It was about 110,000 people. So um, I was disappointed that that wasn't made a media topic because that was a very big deal in the history of Minnesota. But anyway, um, the image, I don't know if you can see it uh, under the umbrella, it's a pair of lacy underwear and it says, this is not consent. Below that is a coat hanger and it says, this is not healthcare. And below that is a plastic toy gun and it says, this is not a human right. And I thought that was pretty much the best uh, political poster I've ever seen in my life. So I asked her if I could take a picture. I'm sorry that I did not uh, write down her name, but uh, that image is repeated on the underside of the umbrella. Um, so, and my process is very organic. I uh, write down an idea like two days after I see the, the year before's show, like when the, when the work goes up, I walk around the show and I'm like, wow, this is so inspiring. And I write down an idea. And then six months later or so, I buy art supplies. Uh, and then about, and then about a month before I'm supposed to actually finish the piece, um, 
I will probably have a different idea and get different art supplies and uh, do a, a photo collage on my computer. There's a company called Spoonflower that prints textiles and the image has to be not a PDF, a JPEG or some other photo formats. So I take imagery, a photo, and then I put words on top of it uh, for the writing part. Um, the raindrops in uh, Do Something, Now Walk the Walk are also an image of uh, a foot x-ray of my foot when it got x-rayed. So I like to layer the words and imagery that somehow relate to real life, my life in some way to create the piece. Um, and I know I don't need to apologize for crying, but it feels like I do. Um, sorry, I'm a crier. As a rape survivor, it's, it's really infuriating to me that this crisis of violence against women is so ignored and that people don't do anything, um, not just politicians and lawyers and judges uh, or TV shows that keep showing us as raped and murdered instead of in as fighting back or if we're fighting back, it's because it's a man that we love uh, or who loves us. Um, it's very personal, it's very individual. It's not portrayed as a systemic misogynist war um, that, is, that is supported by the media and everyone's silence and, and And it's not portrayed realistically. It's portrayed as something that happens in a marriage uh, or uh, as something that just happens to a woman because she's in the world. Um, but like, I don't know, some huge statistic, 75% or 85% of violence against women and children is from someone they know and trust. Um, a teacher, a priest, a doctor, uh, a co-worker, a boss, uh, a police officer, um, anybody, you know, and, but, but a trusted person, a coach. And so it's like the, the women in the young women who were children at the time uh, in the Olympics in gymnastics speaking out and finally saying the investigation was a misogynist sham who that supported uh, the perpetrators and uh, trivialized what actually happened or did nothing about it or said, you know, it'll go away. But um, it doesn't. It doesn't go away in society and it doesn't go away for the person that happened to, for the girl or the woman or anyone else that it happens to. So that's my whole reason for the specificity of language uh, and individual stories in my work is because we need to face it. It's like the, the clarity that was brought to so many people about racism after George Floyd was murdered and Breonna Taylor was murdered. That's always been happening. It's happened since whatever year people who weren't indigenous started coming here uh, and enslaving people and, and, but those of us who are middle-class and white and college educated and have our own issues as everyone does, but didn't comprehend the epidemic continuous unending fact of racism or in this case, misogyny. And so I feel like I need to put that out there over and over again and say, hey, this is, 
it didn't just happen last week when there was a story in the newspaper. It happens all the time and we really do need to do something about it. Um, so, and it's not like you have to give a million dollars or become a lawyer. It's like, if someone is harassing a woman and you're there, tell them to stop. Um, if someone is, a woman is sitting at the bus stop crying, offer her a tissue and ask if she's okay. If you hear your neighbors screaming at each other, call a crisis center and ask them what to do. Um, carry cards with crisis phone numbers on them and give them to people who, or just leave them out. You know, it's hard to, we have so many stereotypes in our heads about who is dealing with what based on looks and our own prejudices and the media's ideas of this is what a homeless person looks like, or this is what a person in crisis looks like. So we can just leave them, you know, in bathrooms on public transportation, you know, at the library, wherever. Um, you can donate money uh, that, you know, there's a lot of organizations who are doing really important work who need it, um, especially now. Take your daughters and sisters and mothers and selves, uh, nieces and friends to self-defense class. Uh, a lot of places now offer them like mother daughter self defense for free I think uh, right in our neighborhood Pratt school offered a class for free to women and their daughters, um, that was fabulous. Write a letter to the editor or email a TV show or if you do I know people do things like Instagram and Twitter I do not. Um, and tell them, you know if they're doing work that trivializes women's pain or makes it look glamorous or sexy or fun or um, okay respond um, uh, and talk to your family and people you know and coworkers about the damage of sexism and talk about fight back and empowerment, you know, because we need to hear, we don't just need to do what the media does, which is an ending, unending portrayal of devastation and anxiety producing information. You know, that's real, but there's also a lot of um, survivors and fight back and knowledge and studies and work and organizations and individuals who are making a positive difference and um, who are here and talking about it. So that's my, that's my whole spiel. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for, for sharing, Trina. We really, really appreciate that. Thanks. Absolutely. Um, we'll go to the next artist. We will be going to Amanda Shopa. So Amanda, if you can share a little bit about your work. Thank you. Hi, my name is Amanda. Um, I I taught, I'm currently a doctoral student over at the University of Minnesota. And before I entered grad school, I taught for 13 years. And while I was at the U, I ended up forming like an art research group with two of my friends, Laura and Sam. And we were meeting about every two or three weeks, maybe it was monthly, it was before COVID. So it's kind of hard to remember what exactly we were doing. But we had different teaching experiences. Sam was a K-12 art teacher and Laura was a middle school English teacher and I had been an elementary teacher. And we were talking about the ways that we were forced by our districts and our administrators and like external rules of teaching to make our students do things that we didn't necessarily agree with. Um, uh, and so we were sort of trying to work through when, and all of us are white, and we were trying to work through when had we as white teachers felt like we had been like forced to make students do things they didn't necessarily want to do for the sake of their education. Um, I mean, standardized testing immediately comes to mind, but also just the like routine of school, that sort of thing. And we were talking and one day after, and I was, we were making different art each week and we're all working in different forms. One day I was on a walk around my neighborhood and I remembered a student that I had over 10 years ago who had been uh, tested for selective mutism before he came in my class. 
he was found to not be a selective mute, but uh, I was teaching sixth grade and I was new to the school and my colleagues were like, oh, he'll never talk. Don't worry about it. You don't have to make him talk. And I, okay. But um, he started talking in my class. And so I ended up, I was asked all the time how I made him talk or how I got him to talk. And I, I hadn't really thought of sort of the implication in the way that that we're phrasing that sentence of like, how did you make him talk? Because I didn't feel like I had made him do anything. We, we would have our morning meetings and we would have our circles and we would welcome each other. And I would just call on him and I would just wait. And he would use body language for a very long time to sort of make his response. And then I would thank him and go on to the next student. I didn't ignore him. I expected him to communicate. I didn't necessarily expect him to talk, to orally communicate, but I expected him to communicate because I knew that he was in our class and he was part of our class and he was part of our classroom community and he belonged there. And um, for whatever reason, he started talking just, just a little bit in my class, but my colleagues were all like, how'd you make him talk? And so I was thinking about this and I was also thinking about the fact that I am way too into true crime. Oh, like true crime podcasts and shows and like law and order, which is sometimes based on true crimes. And I was thinking about the good cop, bad cop narrative and how the good and the bad cop work to get their suspect to talk. And then that got me thinking about the teacher's lounge. And if you have ever been in a teacher's lounge, it can be a very like funny kind of wonder pl wonderful place to be, but I think more often it's sort of a toxic place to be. And it's, it's uh, I didn't actually ever eat lunch in the teacher's lounge because I didn't like being there. But so I thought that was where teachers would have these conversations about students where they sort of expect to make them talk. And so I just, I was ending up sort of combining these interests of true crime and the good cop, bad cop, genre or narrative that we tell with the way that teachers sometimes talk about students and the way that just teaching is seen as making students do things. And so I wanted to, to find a way to portray that. And I decided to turn it into a pencil case because I taught elementary school and pencil cases are sort of students like secret areas. Again, if you've ever taught, especially elementary school, pencil cases are sort of like a, a woman's purse or like a student's backpack. They just hold lots of secrets in them. Um, so I ended up making this. What you can't see in the picture because there wasn't a good way of taking a photograph of it is I then built on the inside, I built like an armature out of plastic canvas and um, weighted beads and just epoxy. And then on top of it, I glued a whole bunch, like everything that's basically listed here on the screen. I glued um, colored pencils and pencils and a lip balm container, this tiny little thing of hand sanitizer. And I glued that all together and I put that inside and I did that for two reasons. The first one was because otherwise a pencil case is really floppy and very hard to display. Um, and so I wanted to give it some shape and some form. And I also wanted you to be able to sort of peek in there and see a little bit in the student's life. Now that I'm talking about it, I realize I should have put a note from someone shaped like a football, the little paper footballs in there. Um, so that was how I don't know that I made a conscious decision to use text. I think I was sort of thinking about comic strips or cartoons or manga or graphic novels and that sort of thing. Um, I did make a conscious decision to make their their spoken parts in different stitched fonts, just to indicate that they were different voices being spoken. Um, yeah. And the blue, like there was no conscious decision behind that. That was what I had in my stash and I didn't want to buy something new for it. I wanted to try and use what I already had in my stash because um, much like a lot of us, I suspect I collect a lot more materials than I will ever end up using in my lifetime. <laughs> and I just didn't want to go buy something new. Um, so that's that. Awesome. Thank you so much, Amanda. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we will pop over to our last artist. Lori Talbert, take it away. Hi, thank you. So Amanda, I was immediately drawn to your piece when I was um, putting mine up in the show. 
and it didn't have a title yet. And so I thought they were two people in a coffee shop. I didn't realize until I saw the title of your piece that there were two teachers in the teacher's lounge. But I immediately loved it anyway, no matter who they were. <laughs> but now I totally understand your rationale for that piece. And that, I love it even more, actually. <laughs> So um, my piece is Unburden Yourself. And when I first thought about what I wanted to make, I knew I was going to yarn bomb something. But um, I wanted it to be more than just a yarn bomb. And so I wanted an interactive piece that the viewer could uh, react to and interplay with. And um, I wanted it to sort of reflect what was happening lately, which was COVID. I mean, it's top of mind for everybody. And so I, um, so that influenced the color. So COVID is kind of a dark topic. And so I had this yarn, this dark wool from Guatemala um, in my stash. I, I too have more stash than I will ever use in my lifetime. Uh, so I pulled it out and I wanted to um, something with a lot of, uh, that left a lot of structure, a lot of holes so that you could see through it. And then leave this opening in the top of um, one of the pillars uh, that we have. And I wanted to fill it then with all these masks that we've all been wearing, a lot of controversy with masks. And then um, I thought it would be interesting to put masks on the outside and use those as pockets for people to put their secrets. I have COVID secrets, and I was pretty sure that other people have been harboring COVID secrets as well. So I thought um, that could be the sort of interactive part where somebody could put a seek, write down a secret, put it in there, and um, as a way of to release their secret and burden themselves um, if they hadn't told anybody that secret. So. Um, that was the unexpected part. I didn't know what to expect, what would happen if anyone would put a secret in and what they would write. So yesterday, uh, in, uh, to get ready for this, I stopped over to the textile center and picked up the secrets that were put in there. I haven't looked at them since, I haven't gone in. And so there were 53 secrets, including my own. I started, I put my own secret in there. And they ranged from one word answers to some of them had tiny little itty bitty filled the whole piece of the slip of paper novelettes. Mm -hmm. And they were funny, they were inspirational, they were sad, they were heartfelt and some quite honestly worried me and brought me to tears when I was on the light rail coming back. Mm -hmm. I'm quite honestly honored that they shared their secrets with me. And I actually now somehow feel burdened mm -hmm. by some of these secrets. Um, they were all anonymous, which I'm also, um, some of them I think wouldn't, I want to help, but I can't. I don't know who they are, but I think there needs some follow. I would like to have follow up, but I can't. So they say um, a few people share deep, very dark secrets, um, but there's no process. But I hope it allowed them a process, <clears throat> excuse me, to crack open that little secret that maybe they can take the next step, that maybe they can let, they either unburden themselves and they no longer feel um, any shame or any um worry about their thing, their secret, and may, or maybe they are allowed now to share the secret with one more person to get some help or to um, move on to the next process or even to acknowledge to their own self um, that it's okay, their secret's okay. Um, and my job is not to share these secrets with other people. Um, the note I put on the top was that I'm going to burn them so I will take all of these secrets, put them with my Nepalese prayer flags, burn them all together, and then I will bury their ashes and release them out to the world. Mm -hmm. But it was a very sort of cathartic experience for me. So I'll release my own secret to you. So my secret was that I realized that I have some friends and family that I don't really need to spend any time with, 
you know, I used to think that I had to spend time with them every month, every week. I don't. I really don't need them in my life that often. And uh, it's sort of a freeing sort of experience for me. So. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much. Oh, my goodness. Um, Thank you all so much for sharing a bit about your about your work and the pieces you have in the show, just fabulous content. And um, you couldn't have said it like any more eloquently. So thank you so much. Um, at this point, we're going to jump over and do questions. So I have been keeping an eye on the chat. We do have a few questions. Um, and for everyone who is in the session in our audience, feel free to keep them coming in there. Um, so the first one is for Georgia. So Georgia, thank you for honoring, this is from Mimi Goodwin. Uh, Georgia, thank you for honoring RBG in this way. What words, phrases were surprising and favorites and inspiring? Oh, I'm sorry, Georgia, you're muted. My favorite page is the last page and it is Z and it says Zadik which is a Hebrew word she had in her office. And here I'm gonna get my artist proof and read the definition. (laughs) What was very fulfilling for me was that um, how, 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 how I was, how it did seem to work for me, I don't know about the other viewers, that I got a lot of her life in a very tiny vessel, and that was very fun. Zadik, a person of outstanding virtue and piety. Mm-hmm. And I truly believe um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg made our lives so much better by being who she was in this world. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, We have a couple of comments that I'm going to read through as well. So Susan Welsh said, I'm listening to Trina and remembering the U.S. Olympic gymnast who said the FBI agent who'd taken her report of abuse and asked, is that all? Um, I know, Trina, you had mentioned that um, as soon as this comment was um, placed. Uh, Carlson said, I like the imagery of the rain. This is also for Katrina. So I like the imagery of the rain for so many reasons here, including this image I have of rain putting out gaslighting. So that's a great thought as well. Cool. Um, Beverly also commented, very few of us have escaped from the trauma of abuse by men and women. We all feel the pain. Thank you for sharing. And um, Mimi also had a question for you, Trina. So thank you, Trina, for this powerful and empowering piece and sharing here. I'm wondering if you have created other pieces about women surviving abuse. Trina, can you speak on that? Yes, thank you. Thank you for the comments there. Um, Yeah, thank you. Um, And thank you for the question. Um, Yes, uh, there used to be a website called minnesotaartists.org that for 20 years, let artists who don't have their own websites put up uh, something about their work. And that had to change into something else. And then Ramon, um, which is sort of a, it's part of the, um, anyway, I don't know if they're official. I think they're part of the JCC officially, the Jewish Community Center in Minneapolis. And they are a clearing house for sharing uh, the work of Jewish artists for uh, putting what we're doing out into the world and in their monthly email. But now they've also, they did a website um, that is amazing called minnesotajewishartists.org, no spaces. Um, And uh, imagery of my other work, which I think all has words in it. And uh, most of it is about uh, violence against women and also the experience of being uh, growing up a girl and being a woman. And several of those pieces uh, were, have been in common thread shows since I moved back here in 2015. So thank you again, Textile Center for giving us 
access to sharing our work once a year for um, the for being a member. And uh, so yes, uh, minnesotajewishartist.org has a webpage for me, Trina Porty, and there's more of my work there. Most of it has been at the Textile Center. Some of it is just images that I've made that haven't been shown. Um, yeah, so thank you. Great, thank you so much. All right, now going on to Amanda. So um, Beverly commented, um, I love this. My experience has been that I can't get them to stop talking, referring to teaching in the classroom. <laughs> Um, and also Mimi asks as well, thank you, Amanda brought back days of teaching. How do you see arts as essential work while teaching? Um, I don't know if you mean for me or for the students, like if you mean for me at the end of the day or for the students, um, I'm majoring in curriculum and instruction at the university. And I transferred while I was at the U into a track called arts and education because my research incorporates artwork into it. And even though I was a general ed and gifted ed teacher, I was never like an art teacher officially. I'm not certified in art education or anything. I worked at schools that were arts integration schools and I was out in the DC area for some of my teaching experience. And the Kennedy Center for Performing Arts has a program called CETA, C-E-T-A, which is Changing Education Through the Arts. And it is this amazing program where we learned um, all sorts of different ways to incorporate art into the classroom. I think a lot of times teachers get told to do cross-curricular arts incorporation, incorporate STEM or STEAM or whatever kind of the hot trend of the day is, but they're often not given the resources for that. And so a lot of times it can turn into we're studying flowers in biology, draw a picture of a flower and label the parts of the flower, which is not really arts integration because they're not really learning through making and reading and understanding arts. And so the CETA training really taught me how to incorporate art making and like understanding arts and that sort of thing. And we did um, Tableau where the students were using their bodies to create images together and scenes and that sort of thing. We learned to do uh, to like read portraits and make portraits that would um, represent something coming through them. So that was a really big part of my work. And uh, I just found the students were so much more engaged when it was something that was like an active sense making. And I think I started teaching right as the rules for No Child Left Behind were coming down. And so I think that it really turned into a lot of skill and drill, especially because most of my teaching career was spent in Title I schools, which are schools um, where there are higher levels of poverty rates and a lot, and oftentimes higher levels of um, English language learners. And so there's a lot of pressure to get very high test scores. And um, we refer to it as a, an achievement gap, but it's really an opportunity gap as other scholars have said. And so it, I think that being able to incorporate these things and, and be able to show that no students are learning this way was really important. And then for me after school, um, teachers spend way too much time of their own time grading things at home at night. And at some point you have to say no, and you have to go do your own thing that does not relate to your kids because you are not going to be paid for all of that work that you do. And you are not gonna be appreciated for all of that work that you do. So oftentimes I would come home and I would watch Law and Order while knitting or cross stitching or doing something else. <laughs> so. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, I think um, while we're on this subject, Amanda, I figured we'd jump to this other question. I know you, I think you touched on it a little bit, but um, this is from Amy Bell. Um, do you find it difficult to incorporate textiles into your doctoral work? Does the U of M legitimize a textile as a medium? Um, so I'm in the arts and education track and I'm doing arts-based research and I'm incorporating photography uh, because I have a dark room in my house. So I'm incorporating film photography and I am incorporating textiles in it. The incorporation of textiles, I think is fairly new for my department. I think a lot of, because most of my colleagues are trained art teachers, a lot of them paint, a lot of them do um, drawing, painting, sort of visual um, medium, 
media like that, but textiles are fairly new. I don't know if they're going to legitimize it. I'm doing it. And I suspect that I'll pass. Um, I think my age might be a bit of a benefit here. Being a graduate student in my 40s makes it so that I can sort of get away with things. I think that sometimes younger students can't get away with. And I think it's not that younger students can't get away with it, but I think that sometimes the younger graduate students are trying to live up to these expectations of who they should be in the academy. And I, I'm 41, I don't care. Um, so I am actually keeping a journal of my dissertation process. It's right next to me, which is why I can just reach down and pick it up. This is every day since I became a candidate, which means I passed my exams. This is like a color coded diary of what I've done every day since I passed my exams. Um, it's way longer than I thought it would be. It's kind of turning into a Doctor Who scarf because this process is taking longer, but it will definitely be part of my defense. Wow, that's amazing. Awesome. Thank you so much. Wow, wow, wow. Um, <clears throat> I'll continue down on the chat. So I apologize, Beverly Sky. Um, one of the comments, it says, wonderful, reminds me of the Ellen Bass Writers Project called I Never Told Anyone. I believe that's in relation to Lori. Uh, Lori's work, so we'll pop over there. Um, so Deborah Harris um, said, all of the pieces with the backstories are profound. Love, love, love them. Thank you for using your voice to express my thoughts and feelings. So that is also for, for Lori. And Amanda actually asked the question, um, Lori, I'm wondering if you made the masks pockets with the idea that others would be able to reach in and read the secrets, or maybe I'm the only nosy person who did <laughs> So they were open so that you, yes, you could reach in and read them. Um, not necessarily by design, but I didn't want to prohibit that from happening. So Amanda, did you find anything interesting when you reached in? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There were lots of people that felt like I was about certain things. Um, yeah. I mean, it, it was, I think it's a lot of feelings that a lot of us have been having of sort of the good and the bad of COVID and of being home and of vaccines being out, but people not taking them. But I would visit with friends and my friends would not reach in. And I, I would like go around <laughs> and I would just like, I mean, I always put them back. I always put them back. And it's not as if I would, you know, wait for someone to write a secret and then go grab it to see, you know, there was no yeah. one around. <laughs> um, but I was like, if if she wanted it to be that no one could ever read the secrets, she would have made a tiny little slot at the top, like a yep. bank, mm. you know, like a piggy bank. <laughs> yep. So yeah, I enjoyed reading them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I thought it was interesting too. So some people, there was some pencil writing, right? Because I think there was a pencil as an option. And, you know, some people wrote lightly in their pencil and some were like, you know, like really dark and hard, like they must have had some, it was a very deep emotion and they got, it got darker and harder as they were writing. It. So I'm like, I don't know if they were getting more angry or more, more intense as they were writing their things. So you could tell that the, their emotions were coming out as they were writing. So very interesting. See, that makes me think about um, with Amanda's piece as well, just thinking about the difference in font and how that can imply a difference in like people talking. So even thinking about how it's like pressed into it is really interesting too. Like even using words just like that is, is really interesting. And it's something you can't achieve without, at least in Lori's case, someone being there in person. Cause I mean, unless you're there when someone's typing on <laughs> their computer, you can hear how like hard they're pressing, but in terms of how it's, how it appears at, as the actual text, you can't see that unless you're using bold, of course. Um, <laughs> so um, next question, another one for Lori. So this is for Mimi. Thank you, Lori. I am curious about other community art making you've created. <clears throat> so um, as a yarn bomber, some, you know, you've, I typically do it under the cover of darkness in the morning. So I'm a morning person. So I'll go out in the morning and uh, put up things. Um, unless you live in my neighborhood or maybe around the lakes, you haven't seen anything, but I do. The city of Minneapolis asked me to knit for Mary Tyler Moore a lot. So I've knit some items for Mary Tyler Moore statue downtown. So you may have seen that. So for uh, the Super Bowl, I gave her some mittens 
and uh, she had a scarf. And then for the NCAA, I gave her a uh, referee jersey and I gave her a basketball in her hand. So you may have seen those items. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So we'll keep a lookout. <laughs> um, so just to continue down, um, I'm seeing if there are any more questions. All right. We have a mention from still on Lori's work. Carlson Kugler mentioned, I like this idea of reading the secrets if you want without knowing who they were. It reminds me of how COVID was such a collective individual thing. Like we were so often alone, but yet sharing in this collective experience of bad, good, et cetera. Um, I think that's a really great comment. Um, we do still have around nine minutes or so. I do have a couple of questions for our artists. So just to continue, um, I have a question for Georgia, just a general question of your, of your book. Um, I don't know if you mentioned this, but how long did it take for you to create this? It took me about three months. Um, and I had to keep right emailing the the director of the gallery and saying can you give me a day or two more i'm not quite done can you give me a day or two more? and she said she finally wrote back and said you're not the only one that's having trouble with this just relax and finish it <laughs> so wow but that was during covid when i didn't have as many distractions as i might have had in my life otherwise also Absolutely. I mean, I really recommend anyone who has the chance to come in and, and see the work in person. It's it's so different to see all of these pieces in person, A, because, I mean, we are talking about text, but you can read the text when you're there, right? It's, it's much easier. Unfortunately, I don't have it, so you can read everything in these images. But if you have the capabilities, please feel feel free to check out the exhibit because it's, it's really great to see. And you can really see the time you put into this, Georgia. So I was curious because it's really, it's really wonderful made. Um, right? Yes. I would say not only this piece, but every time you guys post a picture of one of, your, one of the pieces um, on Instagram or Facebook, I'm always like, did I see that? I mean, I have been in probably three or four times to look at these. I'm like, did I miss that? Where was that? There were so many pieces that I, I just can't get to see all of them or remember all of them every time. So every time you post, well, not every time, but a lot of times when you post, I'm like, I can't remember. I don't see that. I'm sure I didn't see that. That must be something new. <laughs> Right. There's always something new to see. And with how just with how big this exhibition is, ideally in a perfect world, we'd have the space and the ability to write down the artist statements associated with each piece, because every single one, like, I mean, it's clear even here, every single discussion I've had with every single artist, there's so much that goes into every single piece in terms of their own stories and con it's just amazing to, to hear. So I encourage anyone to like, if you see the name, you know, like, maybe strike up a conversation or if, if you can, or try to find them on Instagram and, you know, start that conversation. Cause there's so much more, even with these images, even seeing them in person. And then it goes even further than that. So I just really encourage everyone to just dive in if you, if you can. Um, we do have a question that popped into the chat. So this one's also for Georgia. So is RBG show available online? That show you mentioned. Uh, the one at the, Cut its library. They did do a virtual one. The one at the um, the one at Minnesota Center for Book Arts. I'm not sure if they did that virtually or not. And we just took down Monday a show and break. Uh, no, that was that was a different show. Okay, th those are the two for for RBG. Great, thank you for that clarification. What's the name of the library, Georgia? Uh, which library where the show was um it um wasn't in the library it was a um the cut its cut its gallery in fergus falls how do you spell that k-a-d-d -D, d as in dog a-t-z oh i'm glad i asked i was nowhere close <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. You're welcome. Can I make a comment um, to uh, 
Amanda, Amanda. Um, I was an art teacher. I did my MED at the U. Uh, I was a teacher for 14 years. And like everything you said, yes. Um, and I so appreciate you sharing what it's like to be a teacher, how radical it is that you paid attention and listened to the student who was mute before they were in your classroom and how it just reminded me of so much teacher stuff about, you know, how that was dealt with by the other teachers that they, that they don't listen to their students, that they don't have expectations that their participants, if they are different or differently abled or disabled or however they're perceived as less than the other students. And it, so thank you for everything. And I could talk about this for like a few hours. So thank you. Can I actually share one really short story about this student? I remember one day we came in after lunch or something and, and he was writing something on a whiteboard and it was a movable whiteboard and you could rotate it. So he was on the other side of the whiteboard. And then um, I, I can't, so then I go, I turn around to use the whiteboard because I had this movable whiteboard. And so I would never erase it. I would just do like math on one side and then turn it around and keep doing math on the other. And I turned it around and he had written in huge letters, have a terrible day and a big frowny face and he had signed his name to it and I just started and this is in front of the class and I just started laughing because it was so funny and I said we're gonna do that and we all like the whole class just started laughing and I just thought a lot of other teachers would have been really upset that he had written something negative on the board but I just thought it was so funny and this it was this very like cartoony emoji sort of terrible face and it was hilarious and I just think that and I do want to give teachers a little bit of grace there's so much pressure to get through the curriculum and sometimes it can feel like you can't let your students be humans and I think that can be the hard part sometimes is recognizing that they're people um, I miss the kids I don't miss the parents I don't miss the administrators I really miss the kids yeah. and I have to say my last year teaching was the 2015-16 school year and I have missed it every year and then COVID hit and I thought oh my god I am so glad I'm not dealing with this administrative mess right now because I I couldn't do it so if there's any teachers in the audience that are doing this right now I throw like all of the hats I've ever owned in my life off to you right now because it's just too hard absolutely wow that's that's real. I mean, I can say on a personal note, I grew up with two teachers as parents, and one of which is still te is an art teacher. So, I all the you know hoops that he has, he's had to jump in even the past two years, and everything technologically that he's had to step up to because you know how can you train however many people on staff to like take care of this on top of like a hybrid model and teaching in person and catering to every single student, all these parents like. It's insane. So absolutely any teachers in the audience, thank you. And we, we see you and understand you. Um, yeah, this brings us to about 1 p.m., kind of like what Trina said. I mean, I feel like we could talk for hours. <laughs> There's a lot of content here. And I just wanna say thank you again for our artists. Thank you artists for coming in and you know sharing about sharing more about your work. And um, thank you to the viewers who decide to come in and and listen to the ses session. So one final reminder, if you do wanna see the show in person, it is open until October 16th, so next week. So please feel free to come in. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Thank you so much. Have a good one. Thank you. Thanks everybody, wow, cool. Thank you. The next one should be like four hours long though, but yeah. <laughs> A marathon, we'll, do, we'll, we'll look into it. Yes. And Amanda, I have, I have an art curriculum I wrote because when I got my first gig after I got my MED as an art teacher, they, the principal walked me into the um, shared classroom because of course an art teacher can't have their own classroom. And uh, she said, the textbooks are in that cabinet. And this is elementary school art. And I was like, my head exploded. <laughs> and I was like, what? And I said, that's okay. We're going to do hands-on stuff. It's like students got one third of the year, 50 minutes a week of art. That's it. 
And so I was just, so I wrote my own curriculum, including objective testing. And I used a, you know, book of art and anyway, so like, yeah, I would love to give you a copy of that. It's a really good K-12 scope and sequence art curriculum for elementary K-6. So if you're interested, uh, I don't know, you, uh, you want my email? Sure. Yeah. If you put it in the chat, I can write it down. Or just tell me I can write it down. I've got a pen. Um, The letter T, the number four, the word peace, P-E-A-C-E, at Juno.com. And Juno is J-U-N-O. Because- uh, I'm old enough. I know Juno. Yeah. (laughs) It's like, yeah, it's like totally virusy, ad garbage, you know, belly fat melter ad shit. (laughs) But it's, I just can't deal with Gmail. It's like all the horrible stuff that they do. I'm like, no, I can't deal with Google. So yeah, sorry. (laughs) But get ad blocker, it's free. And yeah, you won't see all that. So so yeah. And thank you, everybody. Wow. Amazing, amazing, amazing work, amazing information. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Have a good one. Thank you. Bye. Bye.